Now, an area that seems to be taking on more and more importance, and it's actually pretty difficult to do, is ESD testing. You know it's electrostatic uh, discharge. Incoming component handlers or user in the field. For instance, examples are a loose slot machine, right? You walk up to the device that is sort of susceptible to ESD. But the interesting thing about this, and maybe a lot of people do know, maybe they don't know, is that these slot machines are all networked together, aren't they? Not only are they networked together, they have software that goes out and looks to see how it's paying off. And if it's paying off too much, they actually change the characteristics of the slot machine so that it doesn't. And of course, if you have ESD coming up, people walking up to this all the time, you're going to have these sparks and issues, and they could cause that not to function properly. Pretty interesting how they uh, do that. And then, of course, even within the uh, casino itself, <clears throat> they'll see, we want these machines to pay off a little more. People see this and it sucks in there. That's the one by the front door or any entrance area that they might have. Now, a printer uh, is a finicky printer in the sense that if the ESD has destroyed some or actually wounded some of the components or caused the component to work wrong, it's not going to work properly. Now, I mentioned that one thing before in another class that the line printer actually would walk up to the line printer and you'd take and push the button to go offline. The line printer is a big unit. They still use them. Not everything done with laser printers, big line printers are used still. And so what would happen is it would not eject light. It might damage the part and things like that. So you've got to look at that. So what we're saying here is these tests are a mandatory requirement for the CE mark, ESD test. They aren't necessarily mandatory anywhere else. So the severity actually is looked at the different levels. And what will happen is, is that you'll actually get a level defined for the type of equipment that you want. Level 1 type, level 2, level 3, this tells you the kilovolts that need to be applied. We're talking about contact discharge. Contact discharge is where you actually have the static gun and you walk up to it or pass it up to it a perpendicular and actually touch the equipment. The thing about it is, is you don't just touch it in one spot. <coughs> you touch it all over the place. Then there's another discharge, air discharge, to actually touch a, uh, a conductor that's away from the unit at a certain distance. You get a spark in the air, and that's for radiated emissions, isn't it? Not conducted. So let's take a look at an ESD generator design. Here's our DC high voltage supply. This right here is a, actually you charge it. And what will happen is that this particular capacitor will charge up. Close this. And then we take and have a discharge switch. That capacitor then will discharge through this effectively resistance into that unit. Now what you have is you have two types of tips on these guns. You have a very curved error discharge connection tip, and you actually have a tip for contact discharge, which is extremely sharp. <clears throat> you can hurt yourself very easily with this. <clears throat> and this is where you actually contact it. And the reason it's so sharp is that they want to get a good contact, whether or not you're perpendicular or not. You're just a little, little bit off because you're working with humans specifically on. <clears throat> this is a photo possibility that you would have you notice how much it looks like a gun? Uh, Doug Smith actually has a, a particular ESD gun, but it doesn't look like this. It looks more like a screwdriver or a probe in that nature. He says that's the one he takes with him on essentially trips when he has to have an airline. Because if he takes it with this one, <laughs> they end up thinking it's a real gun and there are all kinds of hassle at the airport. Wondering what's in it. If it says ESD gun on it, then they really uptight about it. They make sure that the title is very different. Now, one of the things that you need to do is you need to verify the pulse is coming out properly. This is actually what they call a Faraday cage right here. And inside this Faraday cage is an oscilloscope. 
telescope with the proper response to what we're trying to create. And right here is the uh, essentially gun that we would attach to this. And we touch this, and it'll get a discharge through that. And that discharge has to look very much like an ESD pulse. Remember when we saw the ESD pulse had been up very sharp? One nanosecond and then dropped off specifically a certain length of uh, decay time? Well, your gun should be checked for this. Now, one of the guys, it was a class, said, do you check your gun very often to see if you're getting the right response? He said, no. So I went through and explained this. And he went back and requested that he get this type of unit to be able to make sure the gun is doing the right proper way shape. If you look at the ESD waveform that's being generated, you'll see that this is the waveform that you should have. And of course, that box you saw before that would actually show you how you'd be able to measure that on the oscilloscope that's inside there. The reason it's in the Faraday cage is to actually avoid that spark from radiating and going inside and causing other problems. So the types of tests that you're going to perform is basically the type of discharge, whether it's a contact discharge, indirect or in or direct. Indirect would be you make a contact somewhere near it and it goes through an auxiliary path specifically. Direct is where you're actually discharging it directly on the device. Got a plastic kind of case, you can't do it direct very easily, can you? Or indirect. You might check it to see if there's any kind of problems. Of course, air discharge is done directly on insulated surfaces, such as a plastic device. Now, you have to look at the location of the installation and the type of laboratory testing and the post installation testing that we do. <clears throat> Here's a kind of a bench layout <coughs> of what we're looking at. And there's a lot to this. Remember, the spec defines this. The spec shows you this diagram. And right here, you'll notice that there is a plane, a ground plane that exists up here. Right? And here is a plate that exists here, a vertical plate. And what is going on here is that you've got a situation where uh, you might be discharging on this uh, particular surface here. See how it couples? Uh, the actual thing directly to it, directly connected to it, or you'd be taking and touching this plate. Like coming in on from this angle causes the charge to go all over the plate, and it has current flows, and what do the current flows do to you? What do they create? That's the magnetics. That's right, magnetic fields which are coupled to the devices next to it. You'll also see that what you've got is you have various 470 k ohm resistors going down to the ground. 470 ohm, 470 ohm here. We want to limit the amount of current that's going through the ground circuit, so that's what that's doing. And any currents that might come up here, that's limiting that. Any currents might going down, that's limiting that. So these are part of the test setup. This is the ground plane reference. That's the floor of the test anechoic chamber you might be using, or the actual test system there. And then you'll notice that actually what happens is you've got to take and be positioned to certain areas and plugged into certain things. And you don't actually need to listen on this. It doesn't need to be there. This test can take several minutes, several hours, actually, to do it complete. And, and with today, you actually need to go through a pretty complete test with ESD. This is actually a floor-mounted laboratory setting a piece of equipment. What you have here is you have your ground plane reference. Notice how it's attached. These grounds are attached, bonded to the actual ground plane reference, specifically. These are the power supplies. But one difference here is you have an insulated panel that has a height of 0.1 meters. It's kind of like, a, effectively, a pallet, isn't it? Shipping pallet. And that's probably one of the reasons, is because you do move this stuff around with a lot of shipping pallets, specifically. But in this case here, of course, we've actually got the equipment grounded itself. You see, you also have a situation where you have indirect discharge. And that right there is going down to the ground. We have the 470 k ohm and the 470 k ohm here. So by touching this, it'll cause a current flow, 
which will cause a voltage there, which gives you a capacitive coupling, and then the current will go, which will give you essentially a magnetic coupling. Here's a case where you're actually going to take and do it inside. The big difference here is you've got a, actually a ground reference plane you bring in. Okay? Because this stuff's mounted down. Maybe it's in a uh, control room. It could be in a, a computer room you know, with insulated floors and things like that. You have the power supply that's actually powering your gun. Then you actually make direct contact or indirect contact according to what the spec would be. But this is that's something you have to actually provide. It's a separate ground plane that you have. Notice it is 0.1 meters wide from there, 0.3 meters wide, and this is 2 meters wide. So you have to position this in front of the equipment as you're testing it. As you're testing these boxes here, if you're going to test this, you actually have to move it over to that point. What happens is, is that you have to control the amb ambient conditions. Take three temperature readings at the start of the test, in the middle of the test, and at the end of the test. Why would you do that? How much electricity conducts through the air is dependent upon the temperature, the humidity, and a lot of these things. Pre test. Exercise all modes of the equipment. Go through it, see if it's functioning properly. Okay, and then you identify which ones are the most sensitive area, the ones causing the most problems. And then you actually perform a test in these most sensitive modes that they run it. See how it works. You decouple the measuring equipment, you select test points uh, very closely. You actually want to set them to where you might suspect there is the biggest problem happening. Now, um, <clears throat> Apply the contact discharge to conductive points, ESP gun perpendicular to device. Go back here and look. Where would that be? Well, this could be an aluminum or a, you know, basically a steel cabinet, and you would actually take and apply that. And many times what they'll do is they'll actually have a plate across here covering up a hole for that, and it could be steel. And the reason you need to do that, and you need it to do it more than one place, you might decide to do it maybe 10 places across the front here specifically, because right behind that plate, we have some pretty sensitive equipment. Down here, maybe you don't have to do that, because all they've got is some transformers and maybe some wiring that exists, but you still need to do it in appropriate places. You might be doing it all the way around. For instance, this could be moving all the way around this piece of Apply contact discharge to conductive points, apply earth discharge to non-conductive points. In the cabinets today, a lot of this outside right here, as far as that goes, happens to be a um, kind of like a plastic coating on the aluminum. Or it could be effectively anodized aluminum, couldn't it? So we're talking about air discharge being applied areas and typically a plate is put in front of this ground and then when you touch it, it causes that to happen. So you've got to look at that. So you can see that actually ESD testing is not a quick process. It can take lots of hours to do, especially on the first unit. And through this testing you might have identified some critical areas which you have to go back and retest under the different conditions. And document all the details. So what do we mean by documentation? We're talking about, well, one thing is you need to actually have, most companies will have a form set up where they document who's present, what the actual equipment is, what this is involved with, uh, problems they might have run across, uh, stuff that they've done, and then you actually use your digital camera for lots and lots of pictures. Lots of, not much more to say. Have you been involved with DSD testing, Jacob? No, not a lot, no. How about yourself? No, we didn't involved. But you can see that with Fluke's equipment, that a lot of people touch it, they should probably be involved with a lot of DSD testing in that area. But you remain to support use of the equipment, I suspect. You wouldn't do it, but that would be done. 